Hi everyone, I'm Paul Verna, Vice President of Multimedia at eMarketer. Thank you for tuning in. Tech Talk Tuesdays are special presentations where we open our studio to guest presenters from the worlds of media, ad tech, and martech. This session is particularly special because it's targeted to our EMEA fans. The title of today's webinar is Decisioning, Marketing's Game Changer, Six Steps to One-to-One -one Personalization. This implies that while real-time, omni-channel, and one-to-one -one have become buzzwords, decisioning needs to be at the forefront. Today's session will address what decisioning is and how it can provide one-to-one -one personalization. Joining us today is Paul Morell, Director of Partnerships at BoxEver. He'll be sharing with us the steps needed to unleash decisioning and one-to-one -one personalization in your organization. Before we hear from our presenter today, please keep in mind that you don't need to take notes. You'll receive a link to view the slides and full recording of today's presentation. Today's topic is very popular. We have a lot of registrations for today's webinar that include leading retailers, banks, and brands throughout Europe, and we want you to participate. You can use the window on the lower right-hand side of your screen to ask questions. We'll try to respond to as many as we can, so please keep them coming. So let's get started. Take it away, Paul. Thanks, Paul. And hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Boxever is a personalization platform with a decisioning engine that uses data and AI to make every customer interaction smarter. We work with some of the world's leading brands who have all realized one thing. That the era of price and product is over and that the new battleground for customer attention is experience. With a battle in full swing, Brands around the world are trying to become much more relevant, contextual, and personalized when communicating with their customers. They want to live up to the emerging customer expectations by delivering inspiring, exciting, and reassuring interactions that flex in the moment and can move seamlessly from channel to channel. As the hunt for ever more personalized customer experiences has intensified, real-time, omni-channel, and one-to-one -one have become the buzzwords of the moment. But one word is conspicuously missing, decisioning. And it really shouldn't be. You know, without it, the kind of smart interaction that will allow brands to lead in this age of experiences is very difficult to achieve. But what is decisioning? Why is it such a game changer for brands? And how can you master it? That's what we're here to discuss today. So first of all, what is it? You know, boiled down, decisioning is a technique that blends data, rules, and predictive analytics to make smart decisions about what to talk to customers about on what channel at any given time. So let me give you a sense of what this looks like in practice. So you might, for example, fast track the right customers through your IVR system. You know, we've worked with clients to help them prioritize callers who have recently experienced a service failure, or maybe it's VIPs with a large social influence, or you might want to react to service issues with a more precise, considerate touch by suppressing inbound and outbound marketing communications to those people affected until the issue has been resolved. Maybe making your customer communications you know, really hyper-relevant, useful and mobile is the priority. And combining geofence technology with historical and in-the-moment contextual customer data, you can deliver timely, localized and personalized offers at the times and places that matter most. And cumulatively, you know, these micro engagements really start to add up. Within just eight weeks of implementation, our decisioning engine helped a leading Asia Pacific airline generate four and a half million dollars through intelligent cart recovery, uh, about $2.1 million through urgency messaging, and $450,000 in incremental ancillary revenues. Elsewhere, our platform helped a leading consumer brand in the Americas deliver a million dollars in incremental revenue within just one week. And over the longer term, customer experience improvements across a number of inbound and outbound channels led to a 60% NPS increase. You know, these kinds of use cases and the world of next best action may well be familiar. And actually in a way, decisioning is nothing new. So marketers have been working with tech and data teams to optimize communications in different channels for quite a while now. But so far at least, the vast majority of marketers are only scratching the surface of decisioning's potential. You know, they're really practicing decisioning with a handbrake on. Why? 
Well, by and large, the industry has convinced the world that decisioning or decision management is a product to be bought, you know, that you can call a vendor, buy something off the shelf, and that'll transform your communications overnight. But for businesses that really want to lead in customer experience, it's nothing like the truth, and it's holding CX and business results back. Many businesses who have tried to make strides in this area are still left with disjointed, impersonal, and untimely customer interactions. Decisioning as we see it is much more fundamental and ambitious than something you can simply plug into your business. You know, it's a technique, not a product or a single piece of tech. And treated in this way, it's got huge potential to transform an organization's capability. You know, it can deliver smarter customer interactions that can move from channel to channel and really be flexible in the moment. And it's these interactions that are going to keep you relevant and hopefully keep your customers loyal. It delivers the obvious bottom line benefits, you know, the more efficient, effective and engaging campaigns in turn will lead to increased brand loyalty, you know, revenue and profitability. And it offers a new level of instant accurate feedback. It isn't just about what information you send into the outside world, you know, done well, it's about much more. It's about constantly listening to how your customers are reacting in the moment and feeding that actionable insight back into the business. And it really empowers agility. You know, a well-run decisioning operation is going to be in tune with the needs of your business. And as and when the business need changes, it allows you to adapt quickly. So if you need to change for the strategic focus from, say, margin to revenue or reducing churn, or maybe respond to external events beyond your control, you know, perhaps uh, acts of God or regulatory change. It can help you react, you know, from oil tanker to instant. And you know, that really adds up to a new level of business agility and a quicker path to innovation. You know, and critically, decisioning allows you to balance the needs of the business with those of the customer. And while it may sound deceptively simple, you know, it's imperative. It means you won't lose sight of what resonates with customers as you push through a business change or your business objectives as you drive CX improvements. And the result of this means that uh, you're going to reach your objectives more quickly and efficiently and hopefully with less risk. And it can really become the heart of how your business creates, implements and refines customer strategy. So hopefully you can see how our vision for decisioning and what it can do is about much more than plug and play. You know, yes, tech plays a huge part and yes, it's been enabled by a greater adoption of AI and machine learning by the marketing teams. But getting it right is both an art and a science, you know, a real blend of people, organization and technology. And it's this holistic, more expansive understanding of what decisioning really is that's set to drive huge benefits uh, for customers and business. Achieving this holy grail, you know, really isn't easy. It's not a one year job. And it's not one big transformation initiative or, um, or IT procurement project. The how of decisioning is often difficult to envisage in the face of some of the barriers that stand in the way of progress. You know, and that's before we even get to the challenges of siloed data or legacy technology. Only 6% of marketing execs believe their teams really understand the MarTech landscape. And 25% of businesses don't even have someone dedicated to improving CX. You know, Harvard Business School research that says that, um, you know, that's the number one barrier to CX. So in the face of these kinds of barriers, it's often difficult to know where to start. But in working with some of the world's leading brands over the last decade to help them introduce decisioning to meaningfully improve their CX, we've come up with uh, six clear things to target. So firstly, think big, start small. So it's easy to look at the sheer scale of what you're trying to achieve and not know where to start. And that's why we're a big believer in the power of starting small. You know, don't see the path ahead as one big digital project. You know, progress is best made through constant innovation, experimentation and refinement rather than big leaps forward. You know, think uh, crawl, walk, run. So focus on experimenting, beginning with use cases closely aligned to the business needs. These early initiatives will undoubtedly uh, pay for themselves you know so don't worry about being perfect find the team tools and data that work for you you know once you prove the value you can be in a very different conversation and be really well positioned to build a business case for increased investment and more far-reaching change so some practical 
points to get started with. You know, run an internal workshop with representation from across the business to establish the core building blocks, establish clear CX goals, and unpick the basic principles of decisions, offers, and actions. You know, going forward, make sure this group and all early decisioning teams have cross-functional support and buy-in from at least one senior sponsor. Adopt a startup or disruptor mentality. You know, start with that small team, ring fence from the rest of the business, and use them as a lightning rod to build the case for change. Embed an agile, test, learn, and throw out mantra that favors an iterative approach. And do it by giving these early teams and projects the freedom to fail and prove out assumptions. And start with just one or two use cases aligned to existing strategic objectives. You know, agree what good looks like with key internal stakeholders and communicate clear, tight metrics. And look beyond the usual selling use cases. You know, in our experience, solving servicing or service recovery problems is a, is a great way to build advocacy. And not just with customers, but also the internal leadership team. You know, give people a really great story to tell about what you're doing. Second, embrace decision first. So being decision first means focusing your approach, first and foremost, on the needs of your business and of your customer, unrestricted by how you've done things previously or what you perceive to be possible. When previously you might have taken your available resources, you know, data, for example, as your start point, think firstly about the change that you want to bring about. You can then identify and assemble the right resources you need to deliver it. So some start points. Make sure your thinking is unbiased by old expectations and ways of working. Start with a clean slate, taking your customer and business objectives as your start point. And as we just said, you know, once you know your objective, make sure you're led by that rather than by, say, the, the data or the technology that you have available. And identify the most impactful use cases that are going to give you the highest possible return on investment and develop a 12 month roadmap to deliver them. You know, and establish roles and responsibilities early as your cross-functional group sets about delivering roadmap. Thirdly, structure your business for CX. So traditional business structures are not built for a customer-focused world, and in many cases, actually prevent the kind of joined-up collaborative thinking needed to help decisioning achieve its potential. Ideally, decisioning should be backed by an organization structured around how customers think and behave. You know, those structures deliver interconnected, flexible teams, each with a clear stake, not only in CX, but also in a clearly defined strategy. You know, these structures are pretty rare. Today, you know, most businesses exist somewhere on a spectrum between traditional models, where responsibility for CX is scattered across existing channel teams, each with overlapping roles and responsibilities, and more progressive models that centralize ownership of CX and decisioning. You know, embedding organizational change isn't straightforward. We know that it takes tough conversations, hard decisions and investment and a genuine willingness to challenge the status quo. You know, thankfully, you don't need to wait for change to move forward with decisioning. The short term alternative is putting sensible cross team governance in place to align the business and provide a framework for progress. You know, and then your org structure can then evolve at its own pace. So a few start points. So understand really what kind of business you are and how your structure helps or hinders joined up CX efforts. You know, so ask yourself, does your organization structure mirror the needs and behaviors of your customers? Draw up a long-term plan for organizational transformation with the goal to, to really embrace a more progressive structure that eliminates silos, removes overlapping or contradictory roles and objectives, and aligns the business under a single CX strategy. And take short-term steps to empower progress in the short to medium term. So putting the right governance structure in place is easier to achieve than organizational change, as we've just said, um, and it can be just as effective. You know, the building blocks of a good CX governance start with gathering those key stakeholders together, commercial, operational, digital, and channel leaders, into a cross-functional steering group. And then gather and combine those strategic imperatives and reach a consensus across that group on what the business should be talking to customers about and build a framework for then arbitrating between those teams. Fourth, treat decisioning as a system of operations. 
So at its best, decisioning is completely in tune with the needs of your business because it empowers rapid evaluation, change and improvement and allows you to adapt plans as situations shift. It can sit at the heart of how your business delivers its strategic objectives. But treating it as a product or just another marketing system is not going to deliver those kind of benefits. You know, realizing those benefits relies on creating new ways of working. You'll need teams, structures and processes to monitor results, measure outcomes against a set of clearly defined KPIs, filter the findings and recommendations from across the business and commit to refinement on a continuous cycle. So to get going, you know, make sure you can clearly articulate your company business plan at a departmental level so that it really is actionable and that can then be used as an input when designing decision strategies. You can build and communicate the structure, feedback loops and processes that will allow that continuous refinement of decision strategies as we observe how customers are reacting to the offers and actions we are generating. And put a big, big focus on measurement. You know, without it, you're not going to be able to demonstrate the difference your campaigns are making and refine them appropriately. And you'll struggle to, to demonstrate the value to senior stakeholders as well. And embrace qualitative feedback as well as quantitative results um, as you evaluate those campaigns to really get a sense of how customers and colleagues are reacting. You know, they're important their opinions rather really matter and frontline colleagues especially are ideally placed to give feedback on how those next best actions are resonating with customers. So number five is get the right skills on board. You know, decisioning requires a range of people and teams with an emerging set of skills but as companies become more mature and experienced these teams need to be flexible and be able to adapt. Knowing the potential, but also the limitations of personalization is key here. Marketers, for example, you know, they can't set the direction of travel for decision models or refine campaigns without knowing that their colleagues have the right blend of skills to put them into action. So again, a few start points. To hire marketers and IT professionals, not only for the skills that they have, but really for their capability to learn and grow as expectations change. You look for people who can blend marketing knowledge and technical know-how, you know, real marketing technologists who understand the role of different systems and the right way to get them working together and get the right blend of skills in place too. So, you know, decisioning requires a cross-functional team of specialists, data scientists, developers, architects and marketers, you know, as well as those marketing technologists and introduce processes and a culture that encourages collaboration. And that's going to be critical to successful decisioning. You know, while you build new teams and structures, you know, what can you do to encourage them to work together? Last one is number six, get the right tools. You know, technology is the canvas on which decisioning plays out. You need the right tools to realize the potential of decisioning and importantly, the potential of your teams now and in the future. So to get going, Assess your existing tech stack to establish exactly how prepared you are for decisioning. You know, can you easily access your data to inform future decision models? Where are your predictive models and model scores currently being used? You know, where aren't they? And you need to unify more than just your data. Unifying the data is, um, you know, it's become pretty complex now, but actually most tools struggle to unify or centralize that decisioning. So if you want to deliver joined up interactions across channels, Select API first tools that easily integrate into your stack and bring your business rules, logic and predictive analytics together in one place. And try to pick tools that, that democratize decisioning. So giving everyone, you know, whether it's the data scientist or the marketer, the ability to collaborate in creating, testing and refining those decision models. You know, and try as far as possible to future proof yourself by, by avoiding vendor locking. So try and keep your decisioning technology, channel, model and logic agnostic. You know, that way you're going to be able to pursue a best of breed architecture in the long term. And finally, you know, beware of point solutions, channel specific, that really sell, you know, black box off the shelf optimization um, and brand it as decisioning. You know, you're quickly going to reach the limits in capability and you won't be able to quickly leverage tomorrow's analytics 
and data science as you move forward. So that's it. Now those are our six steps. They're all of varying sizes and complexity. Um, you know, business needs to think if they want to unleash decisioning and go about priming the business for big strides forward. You know, we appreciate they're not for the faint-hearted and uh, you know they're not overnight fixes. But our experience suggests that a more ambitious approach to personalization, paired with long-term planning, leads to the best results. You know, it's helped our customers stay relevant with theirs and maximize the commercial value of every single interaction, you know, in ways they never previously thought possible. So I'd finish by encouraging yourself to ask you and your peers some big questions about your current CX strategy, organization, skills, you know, and tech stack. Business is looking to unleash decisioning to make big strides forward in customer experience, you need to take some bold steps and answer some big questions about what you want to achieve and how you want to get there. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, if you'd like any more detail on what we've talked about, uh, then please feel free to get in touch. Uh, the details are there on screen. Um, and also on our website, at the link there is, uh, is a more in-depth white paper on decisioning. Um, but Paul, I think we, we have time for some questions, if, uh, if anyone has any. Yeah, uh, thanks, Paul, for a great presentation. And um, apologies to our audience for saying Paul all the time. And it might be hard for you to keep track of who we're talking about. But this is um, eMarketer Paul now. Uh, BoxEver is a new advertising partner with us. And we're very excited to have had you join us today. So thank you for educating eMarketer's audience. And we hope to have you with us again soon. Now, Paul, you referred to some big questions in your deck, so we move on to uh, the Q&A, big questions that we have been receiving from our audience. Um, let me start with this one, Paul. What are some of the common pitfalls you observe when trying to implement a decisioning platform? Yeah, okay, good question. Um, I think I'd, I'd probably go back to that, that point we made around starting with the outcome or rather, you know, in case of some of the pitfalls, you know, maybe not starting with the outcome, but almost going bottom up rather than top down. Um, I've seen some organizations really spend a lot of time looking and thinking that they have to get all the data together in one place. Um, they have to build, you know, almost a perfect single customer view before they can embark on the project. You know, and the reality is, you don't need all the data in one place. You, you kind of just need the right data. Um, also, you don't need all the data to be real time. You know, in my experience, the, the real time data that's really important is that contextual data from the channel to really understand what's the, the current customer intent. Um, I've seen organizations spend, you know, years trying to build the perfect single customer view. And actually in that time, They've not really been able to demonstrate any meaningful business um, uh, outcomes from it, which really, you know, in my mind, isn't a good use of time. So actually start with the outcome. What do you want to achieve? And then go and find the right data um, to deliver on that outcome. And again, I just go back to another point that I made there around um, measurement. If you don't bake in measurement at the very outset, it's really, really difficult to do it afterwards um, and you know, not accurately measuring the effectiveness of what you're doing that's really going to impact on your ability to to refine through time what you're doing and also your ability to communicate those successes um, outwards and upwards so yeah that's what i'd say around uh, some of the common pitfalls that i've observed and paul if i can follow up with a question about measurement since you brought that up in your deck and just now is there any standardization in the industry around met or around measurement or is it incumbent on individual companies to establish their own path um no there are there are common standards i think um things haven't moved on in terms of the approach it it tends to be via control groups that, that this tends to be done. Um, and I know, you know, there's a real science uh, involved in selecting the right control group to measure against. Um, but again, you know, my observation is that um, that's really the standard by which uh, people still approach the, the measurement of, uh, of decisioning. 
Next question, um, is a lack of analytical models or data science capability a barrier to getting going? Um, I can understand why people might think that, but again, my experience is that it really isn't. And if you think about the start point for a lot of organizations, that there's a very often a reluctance, um, especially when it comes to, if you generally want to do one-to-one -one personalization, um, you know, we see more and more recommender algorithms, which are great for, for product recommendations, or maybe it's what to watch next recommendations. But when you're really looking to do one-to-one -one personalization, I, I think there is still a reluctance to hand over decision-making to, to black box algorithms. And actually a lot of organizations, they really put value on, on transparency and understanding why customers were made certain offers um, or recommendations. So, what clients tend to do is they would start in a rather simplistic manner using rules, which obviously are very transparent and explainable. And then what they do is once they've got the confidence that they've got a handle on the technology is they start to scale um, in terms of their ambition. So then they start to bring in uh, propensity scores um, or start to bring in real time analytical models. But all the while they're able to test against what they had. So, you know, A-B testing around rules versus models, etc. But I think that's when they gain confidence is by having an open, transparent approach. Um, and then they learn and evolve as they go along. Um, I think another point is some client organizations, they tend to struggle to, to recruit and retain the very best um, kind of data science capability in-house. And I think the best model that I've observed is where, is where clients, um, they build an in-house team, but they also augment it with a partner organization. So a partners, you know, they're very often better placed to, to get access to the most recent skills and techniques. Um, and then the client gets the benefit, you know, so they, they benefit from partnering with the right organizations and build their in-house capability alongside that. Here's a, a back to basics question that's a good reminder of how important it is to uh, establish and define terminology. But what is the difference, Paul, between decisioning and personalization? Yeah, so I think um, in our mind, personalization is, is the broader um, term here. And, and I think that ultimately that's what an organization is trying to achieve. Fundamentally, they're trying to deliver a personalized and joined up uh, customer experience. Actually, decisioning is is the vehicle. It, it's the, it's the mechanism by which they can achieve that personalization. So you know, as I said, it, it's very much a technique. Is decisioning. Um, it uses data, rules, and AI, um, and it's really you know it, it's used interchangeably with sometimes with next best action or next best offer. Um, but fundamentally, you know, if, if you follow the rules that we set out and you're able to deliver on decisioning, then that's going to ladder up to the overarching objective, which is to really deliver a personalized and joined up customer experience across all your inbound and outbound channels. You mentioned the need to unify data and decisioning. Do you have any best practices or recommendations around that? So unifying the data, I think, again, I, I'd make a similar point, which is you need to unify the right data. So again, you know, don't go on a long journey in trying to bring all that customer data together in one place, get the right customer data, um, whether it's offline, online data. Um, I think unifying the decisioning, that's when you really need um, a tool to do that. Um, and again, being able to, that tool that can, it can implement your business logic, it can, uh, bring together the online and the offline data, but also leverage um, whatever the client's approach to data science is. So a lot of clients, they would, they would run their models offline and they would output model scores. You want to take those in. Other clients want to actually run those um, predictive models in, in real time within the customer interaction. So again, you need quite sophisticated capability to do that. So I would say in terms of best practice, um, you need to go out and find the right decisioning platform that allows you to do that. Um, 
and again allows you to do that in a in a modern kind of user friendly for want of a better term uh, user interface you know some of these some of these systems are they're quite old school um, you really need a degree in data science to to use them but actually what we've tried to do at box ever is build a, a cloud-based modern user interface that really like i said in the presentation democratizes decision making so that everyone can play a role um, and collaborate and come together um, to deliver on that joined up customer experience and the last question can you give us an example of clients who have really embraced this approach to decisioning yeah sure um you know i like working with organizations that have really latched onto the idea but that if they centralize their decisioning, they can you know, genuinely join up the customer experience. But also crucially, um, it's gonna to lead to, to more business efficiencies on, on their side. So one client I was with recently, what they, you know, the, the, the big problem that they'd tried to tackle was, um, was implementing decisioning to, to implement um, their cross-sell strategy. Okay, within the, the selling flow um, and post sales as well. So what they've done is they brought their data, um, their models and their rules together in the platform, but crucially they connected it um, to all the inbound and outbound channels. So whether a client had come to them on the web, on the mobile app, um, or they'd phoned the contact center and they were talking to, um, to one of the colleagues, or even whether they were receiving emails, so outbound emails, um, whenever the client was making a product recommendation, it was driven from that single decision strategy. So yes, the client is, is absolutely, or sorry, the customer is getting that joined up and consistent um, proposition from the client. But from the client's perspective as well, there's all those efficiencies to be gained. So the logic is not embedded in each and every channel. It's embedded once. Um, they know exactly where it is. And whenever they want to change it, they only have to do it in one place. Um, and they see the results in all those channels. Uh, and for me, you know, having a decision strategy in place um, connected to all the inbound and outbound channels is fundamentally what we're trying to achieve here. So you know, I think that's a great example um, of a client that's really embraced that approach to personalization. Great. Well, thank you again, Paul, for all the excellent points and answering all those questions from the audience. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Before we wrap up, I'd like to take a moment to tell you what's happening across eMarketer's media channels. We have our Meet the Analyst live video series, and we'll be closing out this month with a session on location intelligence featuring eMarketer principal analyst Yuri Wormser. You can check out and register for upcoming analyst and tech talk webinars at emarketer.com slash webinars. On the audio side, don't forget to tune in to Behind the Numbers, eMarketer's daily podcast with our host, Marcus Johnson. And finally, please check out the new eMarketer daily forecast videos that bring our forecast to life. You can find them every day in the eMarketer daily newsletter. So again, remember that you'll receive the link to today's presentation and feel free to share it with your colleagues. Thank you all for your time and thanks again to Paul and Boxever. We'll see you all on the next Tech Talk. Bye-bye.